Welcome to the 50th New York Film Festival presented by Film at Lincoln Center. I'm Devika Girish. I'm uh, the assistant editor at Film Comment and one of the programmers of the festival's talk section along with my colleague, Maddie Whittle. And I'm thrilled to welcome you all to this very exciting conversation. We have some incredible guests with us today. We'll get to them in just a second. Um, I just wanna say a few thank yous and make a few remarks. The New York Film Festival has always been about bringing the community together to celebrate cinema. And whether you're joining us in our virtual cinema or at one of our drive-in venues, on behalf of everyone at Film at Lincoln Center, thank you for being a part of this historic edition. Thank you to the FLC board, patrons, members, and dedicated moviegoers who make our work possible throughout the year. As a nonprofit, we rely on your support and becoming a member is a great way to join our community of film lovers, take advantage of discounts and special offers while helping us to continue sharing the best in cinema. If you're not a member, please consider becoming one today. We're also very grateful to our tireless staff and volunteers working behind the scenes to make this festival happen. It's genuinely been a team effort this year, so I thank you to all my colleagues. In addition to screenings, you can access the New York Film Festival from anywhere with our free virtual talk series, which are um, you know, ending tomorrow. And so if you've been joining us throughout the festival, thank you. Do subscribe to the Film at Lincoln Center podcast for Q&As with filmmakers, panel discussions, and much more. You can also subscribe to our newsletter to make sure you don't miss out on any exciting updates or announcements. And do join the conversation on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook with the hashtag NYFF. Last but not the least, a special thank you to our many festival partners, including HBO, who is the presenting partner of all Film at Lincoln Center talks. Today's talk is the last in our uh, new series of talks here uh, this year called Crosscuts, in which we sort of creatively try to pair filmmakers from across the festival's sections, styles, and genres. And I have to say today's talk is, uh, you know, uh, one that we were probably the most excited for and have been anticipating for a while. We have two incredible artists with us today, uh, just giants of cinema, and we just feel so lucky to, you know, get to talk to them in the same room, so to speak, in the same virtual room. And um, today's talk talk will be moderated by Dennis Lim, who is the Director of Programming for the New York Film Festival. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dennis. And I'll let you introduce uh, the filmmakers that we have with us today. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Devika. I am, I have also been uh, looking forward to this event. Um, so, and I'm very pleased to say that we have joining us um, two filmmakers, uh, Heinz Emichels, who has two new films in the festival this year, uh, The Last City and The Lobby, uh, both screened as part of the current section. And we also have Christian Petzold, whose latest feature, Undina, is part of the main slate. Uh, it showed at the Queen's Drive-In last night, and it um, is still available on our virtual cinema for a couple more days. Um, today's event brings together, I think, uh, two not just two great filmmakers, but uh, two of the most um, original thinkers uh, working in cinema today, and also two of my favorite conversationalists. Uh, it is always a real pleasure to hear uh, from both of them, whatever the subject. So welcome uh, and thank you for being with us, uh, Christian and Heinz. Hi. Um, so I thought I would just start, I've, I've come up with just a, a few, a few uh, sort of large topics that I thought both of you could address, um, and I thought this, this, these could be um, interesting ways to illuminate um, your thoughts on cinema, your thoughts on um, how your approach to filmmaking um, has uh, evolved um, over the years. Um, oh, I should also say that joining us today is Margaret Kepler, who will um, help uh, with uh, interpreting if needed, although uh, Heinz and Christian usually don't need the help, but uh, Margaret uh, is, is standing by just in case. So thank you so much for being with us. Um, I'm gonna start with um, just a kind of uh, a big picture question. Uh, and I thought it could be interesting to have you maybe talk through your, the trajectories of your career as a way to illuminate your thinking on cinema, your 
philosophy of cinema, in, uh, so to speak. Um, Heinz, you've had a really interesting um, sort of winding path over the years, starting in experimental cinema, moving to narrative, uh, and then to documentary, um, which is, I think, remains the work you're best known for, this uh, long series of architecture films. Um, and then recently, just sort of making the turn back to fiction while keeping many elements of your documentary work. So I'm wondering if you can just, you know, looking back at the, the, the expanse of your career, maybe um, summarize that for us and, and sort of, and, and, and in a way that sort of suggests how your approach, how you're thinking about cinema changed over the decades? Yeah, I think it was always a case of necessity. I mean, I come uh, from a kind of uh, uh, workers' class background. I saw a lot of film when I was a kid. I saw, but till I was 14, I saw most of the films, I think. And then I, when I became a kind of, a uh, teenager or youngster, I, I, um, I did an apprenticeship to become a photo retoucher. And that, uh, that praxis for three years in a publishing house, really, I lost every idea of a representational image because I saw I can do anything with imagery and people believe it's true, but it's not. And then when I, and I don't come from theater, I must say. I went to theater, but I didn't like it. I didn't like when I was 18 or so, I lost this kind of interest in representational, of, let's call act, acting. And when I, and I was even full of hatred, which it's ridiculous now to say, but, and then I started with experimental films very, uh, on a very basic level to reconstruct filmic movements. They were very abstract. I did that for 10 years, I think, till the end of the 70s. And then I slowly came back to life, life action. And I did four films. I think people called them experimental narratives, but I call them narratives, but... Uh, uh, that's it. And then I, with the last one, I went so broke that I had to drop the actors and work with, uh, with architecture. I worked with architecture for 20 years, all, uh, I would say. So also I taught at the University of the Art and I was not able to do feature films. I always wrote scripts in that time. I didn't come through with uh, producing them, but then after the Streetscape series and Streetscape dialogue, where, when I came back to finding a new way of dealing with narrative, uh, this is the outcome now, the new films, and there will be much more now, yeah, like that. This is it. <laughs> um, Christian, maybe you could say a little bit about how you came to cinema and then also how your perspective has changed since you since you started um i think looking at your body of work um one striking aspect for me is the is the uh relationship with um realism uh and maybe the sort of shifting tension between on the one hand realism and on the other hand something more fantastical or dreamlike, uh, which I think reaches maybe its fullest expression in Undina. Um, so I'm just curious about how you came to cinema, the idea of realism, which I think was quite important to you at the start, and then this tension between realism and its opposite. Um, I'm also from the working class, like Heinz, and my parents, uh, they were refugees, and uh, I grew up in a small town near Dusseldorf. And, uh, it's my parents tried to uh, to live an ordinary life, yeah, really ordinary life, nine to five, and uh, good uh, behavior with neighbors and so on. And there are no cinemas. There were no cinemas in this small town, and uh, just uh, one library. And in Düsseldorf, there are cinemas. And for me, cinema was the other side. I must say to to. Uh, comparing to this uh, ordinary life of the parents. Yeah? And, and I saw the, 
the, the, the photos at the, at the cinemas at Düsseldorf, photos of naked women, uh, uh, very brutal guys, uh, uh, fantastic technicolor uh, pictures. And I have the library where I can read about cinema. And we have, a, in this time, in the 70s, we have a very good TV in Germany. In the, in the 70s, it was by, um, um, there were some guys like Werner Dutsch who make, create programs yeah, where you, they educate us cinema. Yeah? I was, I was never, I was not in a cinema since I was 15, yeah? but I heard about the cinema and it was a promise for me to reach the other side out of this ordinary life with the parents. Yeah? And then uh, I came to Cologne. Uh, there, there was a big museum, Cologne, Museum Ludwig, and they have a cinematheque there and they make fantastic retrospectives there. Yeah. In my first retrospective, I was 16 years old. I have read the book by Trifo, this interview, Trifo Hitchcock interview, uh, in, in the library. Yeah. And uh, they have there a retrospective of all Hitchcock movies. And I've seen them all from The Lodger until Family. Uh, what, I, I, the, I can't remember the original title. F Family Grave, I think, was the last one. Hitchcock. Family, Family Plot. plot. Family Plot. plot. Yeah. Family plus. And, and, and you know, I just know the German titles because of the TV. And, um, and then I, I, I had seen all the Hitchcock movies and the next retrospective was Fritz Lang. Yeah? And with Fritz Lang, I also my interest in architecture starts yeah? because it was, it was built on rooms and spaces, yeah? the, the cinema. And so when I, for, in, in my education, I have to study first literature because my cinema uh, um, desire starts with literature. Yeah? Uh, and, and so I st uh, studied literature in Berlin, but uh, I, I was all, each night I was in the, in the, in the, in the movies. Yeah? And then I, when I was 28, I came to the film academy. And then I have seen, I think three or four years and just, uh, just saw movies with two, most with Hartmut Pitomsky and Harun Faroki in the seminars. And then I started when I was 34, I made my first, uh, first movie by my own. So uh, cinema for, was for me a promise since I was 34 and then it became reality. Do you want, to talk, <laughs> the, you want to talk about the progression from when you started making films to now and how you think how you think the work has evolved. And I, I was specifically curious about just the place of realism in, in your work. Um, yeah, the realism, it's, I, I must say, I, I, from, for me uh, to, um, I, 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 I want to find, um, I, I want to, to, to have um, stories which are, which, which are realistic and I have to find a bewitched, view to these places. Yeah? For example, in Undine, it's so, uh, I don't want to shoot um, very, uh, on very romantic places, this, this love affair, this love story. Yeah? I want to shoot it on, in, in, re in realistic places, in the museum, in a, in a cafe, a cafe, nothing's built in a studio, and there's no fantastic light, yeah? it's just the light we found at the, at the places. Yeah? Not, we don't want to create an impressionistic or romantic or Kasper David Friedrich light for, for this romantic tale, but we want to, to, to find in this realistic, uh, also very ordinary places, we've, we want to bewitch them. Is this a right word? Bewitch? Mm -hmm. bewitch? Yeah, that's the right word. So uh, this, this is, for me, it's something to do with reality, to find the... There is a there is a romantic poem by Joseph van Eichendorf. I was I, when when two years ago during during shooting I have something in my back, so I have to go to a massage. Yeah? To uh, and we have so many esoteric people in the in our team, yeah? and they sent me to a to a um, to an Indian massage, <laughs> and and I'm, uh, I have to lay down on a on a on a bed on the on the roof. There was this romantic poem by Eichendorf and um, it's uh, it's there is a a, a a song is sleeping in all things yeah? and you have to to find 
the uh, um, the, the right word that uh, this song is coming out of the thing, so you can hear the, uh, this song. Yeah, this is some. It's, it's much better than this bad translation I made. Yeah? And uh, so it's it's a little bit like this to find uh, yeah, the 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 things which are hidden in this reality. And in German, it's, it sounds much cleverer. <laughs> um, I had another question uh, to pose to both of you. Um, look, looking at, at, at both your um, bodies of work, something that strikes me is this um, is an interest in repetition um, and a tendency to work with um, recurring tropes and recurring figures uh, and in sort of groups of films. Um, Christian, you have a series of trilogies, like uh, the Ghosts trilogy, the trilogy of love um, during a, a, a oppressive systems, and, the, and you've said that Undina is the start of a new trilogy by the elements, um, and, you know, working with uh, the same actor uh, multiple times, and also carrying over, like, you know, combinations of actors, like uh, Nina Haas and Ronald Zerfeld, and then also Paolo Bear and Franz Rogowski. Um, and then with Heinz, um, you have obviously many ongoing series and rubrics and subsets within your body of work of the Architecture's Autobiography series, the Streetscape series. So I'm wondering if you can, you know, so you're both quite prolific, but there's also something I, I think quite interesting about um, how you how you group your work, how you think of the um, of of the work in you know, bring, bringing this sort of taxonomy to, to your work. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk about just why, why you approach things that way. Maybe we, we start with you, Christian. Yeah, for me, it is when I'm working on one, uh, one, one film, one movie, then there is a possibility of another movie right in the next room. Yeah, it's like, uh, it's, it's like an architecture or a structure. Yeah, uh, for example, working with actors and you call them in, uh, in the USA, they call them supporting actors in Germany, Komparsen. Yeah? And um, for me, all these support, supporting actors who are on the screen, they have to be worth that we can have to, uh, tell a story of, 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 the, uh, of their own. Yeah? We can change the camera position a little bit and we go with them to another 90 minute feature movie. Yeah? And so, I, I like this idea of to make uh, serials and not to make all with all movie some uh, you can I can describe it like this when you when you make movies for festivals and movies for for the art scene yeah, in the world you, you're building museums yeah? For, yeah and so but when you for me I like to 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 have this uh, imagination that uh, there's a street and in this street one house is missed and you have to, to, to build a house in the street and this house has a neighborhood and it's surrounded by something, by social things, by architecture things, yeah? by history yeah? and you have to, to, to work with this neighborhood. Yeah? And so there's one house and then, then there's an, an, a second one and a third one and they are collab collaborating with each other and have correspondences and this for me, is had something to do with cinema, with this kind of series. I think it's something to do with this retrospectives in Cologne. Yes, you have when when I see this, when I saw these movies by Fritz Lang between four, he made between thirty eight and forty seven. Yeah, the woman in the window and yeah, uh, um, Fury. They, there's there are course correspondences. I like this. Yeah? When you when you came from one point and you look a little bit more to this and, and have another focus, and this is uh, for me, it's something. Uh, this is a work, not one movie. Yeah? Is this an answer? I don't know. Yeah, I'm... absolutely. Heinz. Uh, yes, I never planned to do a series, but uh, something s happened like cell division, like a very natural act that there was so much left after I did one movie. So one movie created two others and then these two created four others and so on. And I really can relate to what Christian said with, when he said there's something missing. When I did the architecture series, for example, I just closed it now after 20 years, there will always be new ones, but 
not, I always had the feeling it's not balanced. I did a lot of films about thing, uh, uh, certain architects, but I wanted to concentrate on civil engineering, for example, it wasn't there. And so I, I didn't even want to talk about this whole uh, complex because I, uh, I didn't prove that I had the whole set up there and now I can talk about it, uh, what the whole uh, uh, means for me. But actually in the beginning I wanted to do one film with this guy, uh, Christian Menschen Werner Dutch about architecture in film like in 1993 and now there are about like 70 long and uh, short <laughs> films so it was cell division <laughs> and I, all, I wanted to press it all in one film and how idiotic was that yeah it, it's not possible so I, I became uh, I, uh, I got a little slower and uh, I had patience with myself and said now let's do another film and not press it into one and this went on for 20 years, yes. <laughs> Maybe we can um, spend a bit of time on, on architecture, which seems like um, a logical topic for you, Heinz, but it's, you know, Kristen, you've already brought it up a couple of times. Um, Heinz, um, can you just maybe talk us through your, your how, how this came to you, the way your decision to, what, discovering this new type of architecture film, I, I think, um, a, kind of, a, a kind of architecture film that's more about your relationship to the space and your experience of a space and, and yes. also, yeah. Um, it's, it came out of my uh, work as a cinematographer. Uh, I do the camera myself and I was always interested in complicated spaces. I didn't like empty spaces. I didn't like white spaces. I like multi, multi-level spaces. And so when this, and I always used them before in the films in the 70s or 80s. And then when this crisis started that I couldn't go on with this kind of thing, I said, well, what, what are you actually interested in? And I'm interested in um, filming spaces in transforming three-dimensional spaces into two-dimensional picture planes. That's what I'm good at. I couldn't work as an architect. Or, uh, I'm very bad in three-dimensional plannings or designs, but I think I can put the three dimensions into two and I really enjoy it doing in the camera work. So this is my approach. Also, I think cinematography is not only that you put spaces into your brain and you project spaces with your camera. And this is the active part of it. And that's so uh, totally, fantastic for me and that's of course meant for me to develop a new kind of vocabulary because I couldn't deal very much with the usual uh, narrative movie camera convention so uh, I had to do something about that and I'm still working on it yes. How would you say that this approach has um, has changed I mean as the the recent films especially I think you know, they've complicated the architecture film uh, in, I think, really striking ways by having actors, text, you know, just a lot of, um, just a lot of dialogue. Um, so I'm wondering if your approach to capturing space or thinking about space changed when, sure. when the film changed. I mean, uh, a human being or a human head is a three-dimensional uh, uh, object and you have to uh, and you have to compose it within a space, within the real world of architecture or negative space or whatever is there on the picture, picture plane. And then in a certain way, uh, these actors are surfaces that you compose in your plane. Of course, they are talking and you, you work with them, how they talk and with whom they talk, but your camera is always making connections between them and the space in which they are acting. Christine, can you, um, maybe you want to address some of that? 
Yeah, because it was 1992. I have a seminar by Hartmut Bitomsky in the German Film Academy. And it was a seminar. I was there with Thomas Arslan and uh, Angela Schanelik. We are the pupils. Not, they're, they're, I think not more than these three. It was a luxury situation. And uh, as the plan uh, and the, uh, from, from Hartmut was, we have seen uh, we had seen sequences from movies, and we have to rebuild um, um, the, the 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 places, the rooms, the space yeah? uh, on 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 a page. Yeah? Where is the bathroom? Where is the kitchen? Where are the windows? Yeah? Where the where is the staircase? Yeah? And in the first moment, we thought it it's a crazy seminar what we are doing here, but we rebuilt a world. Uh, the cinema has destructed yeah, and divided and separated. Yeah? And it was very interesting. And, and then we, we all are the assistants of, of Hartmut at his last movie he made before he went to the USA, to Los Angeles, to CalArts. It was about the architect uh, Hans Scharun. Yeah? And it was so, uh, I've never made a movie before by myself. I was just uh, a, a student and an as, uh, assistant, and he's he's, uh, he's filming uh, buildings, yeah? and but he's not filming the buildings like I've I've seen architecture photographers before. He's he's filming uh, the move the movements of people in buildings, uh, how they are how they are moving there, and what 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 this different kinds of houses Sharon built, how how this created social life, yeah? and what what is the idea and what the people are doing against this idea, for example. Eh? And this was so interesting and has some, for me, it has something to do with, with making feature movies. Yeah? It's, it's about space between people, the look. Eh? Uh, the, the, for example, we have this sequence from um, Blue Velvet yeah? where uh, the guy is hiding himself in a cupboard and Dennis Hopper is coming. Yeah? And, uh, how far he is away, Dennis Hopper, how far the stage, the theater stage of this sequence between Isabella Rossellini and Dennis Hopper, this is theater, but Dennis, uh, um, um, David Lynch, he created by space, he created, uh, he destroyed the cinema situation. Yeah? And this was so interesting to, to have this. And so I'm always thinking about uh, the rooms and uh, when we, when I'm, when we making, I never want to go to a studio. Yeah? I always do it. And, um, I find, I find structures and I think how, how you can laugh or kiss yeah? or argue in this structure. How, yeah? And then we have this sequence. I remember Le Mepris, yeah? the apartment, yeah? Michel Piccoli, Brigitte Bardot, what are, what are they doing there? They are dancing yeah? in an apartment, which is not, uh, uh, already uh, uh, made. It's, it's it's like a I can't what Baustelle. That's what's the word? Baustelle? Site, a construction hmm? site. Yeah, it's a construction, and and their love. It's uh, on the other side. It's uh, deconstructed in the same moment, and so this is very. This was uh, so it, it it opens my eyes. I must say. Mm. Um, maybe you could also talk a little bit, Christian, about the a certain kind of space that, that you're, you seem to be drawn to in, in, in your work. Um, this, these sort of, um, I think you refer to them as, uh, as like sort of transit spaces or non-places, um, these sort of liminal spaces that um, I think are maybe, you know, re reflective of, 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 of contemporary Germany in some way. It, I think it has something to do with the film noirs I have seen when I was young. Yeah? Uh, I have seen hundreds of them. Yeah? Most of them are made by what's the name in, in, in America for the for this black series? Is this the same? Is this the word for this film noir? Movie? Yeah, film noir. Yeah? Yep. Uh, there's a, there's an essay by Frida Grafe. Uh, it's uh, the name of the essay is Light from Berlin. Yeah? This is uh, this is a light or the, uh, yeah, from people who had to to go to an exile uh, in, uh, to, to Hollywood, yeah? Germans and Austrian Jews and homosexuals. And, yeah? and uh, they, uh, they created their uh, style, yeah? a style of mo movie making. Yeah? And th this is not only a style of, of shadows and light and darkness and, uh, and noir, it's also a transit. Uh, so most of them are transit stories. Yeah? 
At the beginning, there is a bus, someone is fallen angel by Otto Preminger, for example. Someone is in a bus, one dollar left. There is a diner, a hotel, not more. These are all transit stations. And to find yourself or find a story or find a narration and find an identity in a transit room is the subject of these movies. And I think it's also the subject of the most movies I know. Um, I wanted to ask you both to maybe say a little bit about um, history uh, and I guess about cinema as a means of, of depicting and understanding history. Um, I, uh, Christian, you just completed this uh, sort of trilogy of, of historical films. Um, and I think even your films that are set in the present, like Undina, uh, are very much about how the past is is felt in the present. Um, and I think this maybe also has to do with how you think about time uh, and cinema. Uh, so I'm wondering if you can, you know, I think you started your career with, with, with many, many depictions of contemporary Germany, uh, you know, before moving back into period, period depiction. So I'm just wondering if you have thoughts on, on, on cinema as, as, yeah, as a tool of working with history. Yeah, the first, the first uh, movie I've made for cinemas was uh, The Innere Sicherheit, The State I'm In was mm -hmm. the American title, I think. And it's, it's about people from the past yeah, who, who are living in our contemporary world. Yeah? And so, I, for me, they are ghosts yeah? Yeah, because nobody needs them anymore, nobody wants them anymore, nobody wants to see them anymore. Yeah? And the refugees in transit are, have a, a, a situation you can compare to to this situation. Yeah, it's so um, to 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 have this um, for me, cinema is always contemporary. Yeah, always. Yeah? You, this, uh, but uh, but I think it's uh, the space for contemporary picture. Uh, it's, it's very very very. Mm, it's so you have you have the the past. Yeah? And the, the cinema is very, very slow. Cinema is very slow. You need years to make, uh, to write a script, to find the money, yeah? to, to create this collective who, who, who realize the movie. Yeah? It costs then one and a half year post-production, everything. But it's, but it's going, but the cinema is very contemporary in the same moment. TV is very fast. You take your electric uh, uh, camera, you go out, there's a demonstration or something like that. You put your camera on and uh, you're very fast. But cinema, cinema is, knows much more because it's, it's, so, it's so slow. It's faster because it's slow. Yeah? And because, because it, it, it can read the myths and it can read the legends and it can read the history in another way than television, for example, can do this. Yeah? Oh, <laughs> too much, too much ideas for, for, for my vocabulary here. Yeah, sorry. No. <laughs> um, Heinz, did you want to uh, respond yeah. to that or talk? Uh, yeah. Yes. I, uh, I'm working now on two films. One is called Slaughterhouses of Modernity. I film it and um, it's, I would call it, it's a propaganda film. And it's about Wilhelm II, the German Kaiser, who is for me a despicable person and the first Nazi, uh, first fan, real fan of the Nazis and supporter of them. And uh, strangely enough, I film in that building that uh, Christian uh, has in his Undine film, like the German, uh, the the uh, city castle or city palace we film inside there. For me, it's the most despicable building of the world. That's for me a slaughterhouse. But the rest of the film will be uh, filmed in South America. And um, with the strange fan fantasy of Borges about German Nazis, which I find really crazy. And the second film is a film about German history from 1943 till, uh, till 2020. 
it's a big feature film and it's called Black Harbor. So we are definitely obsessed with this uh, uh, situation in Germany and I was haunted by it. I mean, when I uh, told you I grew up with a lot of films, that was true, but that was in the 50s, that was not in the 70s like Christian. So uh, I got all these B movies with Pacific War and so with Lee Marvin and, and all this kind of film. Uh, but uh, now I'm coming back to a very straight story, what uh, Germany means for me. And uh, I will, it, it will be interesting for me to, whether I can do that. Mm -hmm. Produce it, I mean, my producer mm -hmm. likes it, but maybe I suppose don't. <laughs> so it's a topic always. Um. I wanted to, I was rereading re some, um, some interviews with both of you and um, I'm always struck by this line, um, Christian, that I think you've said a couple of times, uh, which, is, which you credit, credited to um, your uh, longtime friend and collaborator, Harun Faroki, uh, this idea that we, that we don't have um, new, new images of capitalism. Um, mm. And I'm wondering what, I think you said this maybe like 15 years ago, um, and I'm wondering what you make of this observation today. Um, and I, I would pose the same question to Heinz too. Yeah, so two, two answers. Uh, I have something to say about history again. Yeah? Oh yes, please. Yeah, because one of the favorite movies uh, from Harun and, my, and me was from Marco Bellocchio, Buongiorno Notte. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's 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 a historical it's a period picture about the uh, Alumoro case yeah? uh, and um, kidnapping of Alumoro and killing of Alumoro, and in this movie there is a sequence where the young girl who is one of the supporters of the kidnapping, she uh, 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 she's getting doubts about her acting, yeah? and. Uh, in, in, in this moment, you, uh, Marco Bellocchio shows us pictures from Paisa by Rossellini, yeah? from, the, from people who are uh, uh, fighting against the fascists in, in, in Roma. Yeah? And uh, so, and the music by Pink Floyd, Shine on Your Crazy Diamond, mm -hmm. was uh, from this uh, uh, Wish Over Here, I think was the name of uh, the album, yeah? uh, the record. Yeah. And so this is for me something this is history in cinema. Yeah? When, when pictures are getting in touch to each other, pictures from far, long, long time ago, and they, they have a correspondency with the things from 78 and a correspondency to us nowadays. Yeah? And this was a fantastic moment, I remember. The other, the other thing is the, about um, what Harun and I was, was uh, what, what was our lifetime subject? I must say, yeah, it's about the work. Yeah, uh, for me, it's so uh, when you when you're on a party, yeah, or, or, or a dinner, you know, invited to a dinner or something like that, and out people uh, ask you, what are you doing? Yeah? What is your work? Yeah, when you say uh, there is, I have no work, you have no identity, you can go home. Yeah, nobody wants to talk with you again. But the work is vanishing from our society. It's gone, yeah? And uh, so how, how we can find an identity without work? Yeah? This, is, uh, this is the subject. Yeah? This is also the, uh, um, the thing what the neoliberal capitalism is made. It destroys the work and, and it's talking about ident identity uh, 24 hours a day. Yeah? And uh, so this, uh, this is, uh, I think, was our subject to think about this. Uh, coming back, yes, uh, when you ask, can you film capitalism nowadays, or the state of capitalism, uh, uh, when you film a street corner, you have it all there. I mean, you, uh, you can't avoid it. But, but of course, it's uh, when you really want to uh, get it, you have to read it, you have to read theory, you have to read, uh, and you can't depict it because you only can film surfaces. But um, I think at this state of affairs, we are all dealing with a kind of a strange alienation and to finding a new um, 
uh, a new kind of language and vocabulary. I, I have to because this whole idea, these old stories don't get me anymore. Like, uh, so for me, it has very much to do with the uh, formulation of, uh, of a new cinematography, as I mentioned already. And this is my life topic, you know. And of course, capitalism, who can avoid that? I mean, uh, uh, we will depict it even when I film here my floor, it's capitalism. Yeah. I, well, I don't want to be too vague now. <laughs> Have another question, please. <laughs> I, I'm going to start, um, because we do have some audience questions rolling in, I'm just going to start um, uh, selecting from them. Uh, one, there's a question for both of you from um, anne Katrin Titze, who wants to know if you both grew up with German fairy tales. Uh, and her observation is that both Undina and, and the lobby can be seen in the tradition of oral storytelling. Wonder hey, Chris Young. <laughs> 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 I, I grew up with with fairy tales. Uh, my mother uh, said it was a, she was a refugee. She's coming. Uh, she came from uh, Thüringen. This is a, in, in Thüringen. There is a mountain, and in, uh, uh, the name of the mountain is Küffhäuser. And the German legend says that in the Küffhäuser mountain, there uh, Friedrich Barbarossa, the big German um, king, yeah is waiting that, uh, for example, Wilhelm II yeah, will call him, or if later Adolf Hitler will call him, and he came, he came out of this Kultheuser with 1,000 soldiers, and he will rebuild Germany again as, uh, as a big, big, big fantastic con fascist country. Yeah? And uh, so my mother has told me all fairy tales by Gebrüder Grimm, uh, by Hauf and uh, Andersen yeah, when I was very young. And uh, I have given this to back to my uh, children later in the same way. And, and it was very happy because some of these fairy tales by Buddha Grimm are very, very hard. Uh, I, I, I must say they're X-rated. They're, they're, there's there's uh, raping, there's killing, there's slaughtering. Yeah? And so I have to always, I have to read when, when they are lying in bed, the kids, I have to read with, the, with two different eyes. One eye is on the next page looking for the bad sequences. Yeah? So I can change them a little bit and censor them that they are not so hard and they can find uh, sleep so I can see movies like movies of Bellocchio uh, later when they are uh, f fall asleep. Yeah? And did you have a... Uh, read the real stuff to them later, or <laughs> I mean, you can't censor it always, you know. A friend of mine, Uwe Nettelbeck, always had the most ghastly stories for his kids. I mean, that was their education, and he showed them cruel films and made them uh... okay. No, I didn't grow up <laughs> with fairy tales because my parents, I think, didn't read. And I think I grew up with radio and uh, uh, terrible radio music and s sports like soccer in the radio. And then at school, I learned almost every week, I learned one of these fantastic uh, uh, poems. We had a nice teacher and there, uh, so. Uh, great German poems, so I can tell them by heart now still, and that was a nice time. No, fairy tale's not, unless you say Karl Mayer's fairy tale, which it is. So I think I read 80 Karl Mayer books or something. I too, I too. <laughs> Later, yes. <laughs> uh, but Grimm's and so on, the lobby is more like a stand-up uh, comedy than a fairy tale, I would say, yeah. When, we get back to the uh, person who asked the question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm just reading the full question. And um, her observation, um, Anne Katrin's observation, is that there are, there are plenty of Brothers Grimm tales with a personified figure of death, which is why she made that, uh, of course, that observation. Of course. Yes. Even we ourselves die and think about death. <laughs> uh, a question about. Uh, 
uh, class um, for both of you uh, from Josh Youngerman. Uh, you both talked about coming from from uh, the working class, uh, and Josh mentions uh, this is uh, the, that Christian loved the film Den of Thieves. Uh, this is something that <laughs> made this is something that made headlines <laughs> when you came to New York the last time, uh, and. Um, uh, one of the reasons you loved it was because it was for this depiction of the working class. Um, and do you think, do you both think modern day cinema has failed uh, to target the working class? Yes, but, but not only the modern cinema, I think. Uh, I remember that uh, Haroon had made a short movie, Workers Are Leaving the Factory. Yeah? Mm -hmm. This was the first movie ever made. But the workers had left the, uh, the, the family. There was no picture inside of the family. Uh, a factory, not family, sorry. Factory, but also family is also a factory. And um, so Harun and I, we thought where, where you can see work in movies. Yeah? So we, well, there was this movie by Paul Schrader, Blue Collar. Yeah? You, have, you have a factory, you have people who are working for the union. Yeah? And, uh, but I think that bank robbery is something to do with the working class. You can, and I've, I've seen the movie by, by Michael Mann, uh, The Thief, I think, yeah, was with James Caan as one of the first. You can see that this is a, a, a working class. This guy knows how to break a safe or to make a robbery, to make a plan, yeah, to, to work with his skills, yeah, work with his, um, with the with the things he learned yeah, uh, in from from other workers, yeah? and so we thought about uh, what is what is happening to work in cinema. It's vanishing, but it uh, comes out on another place in the cr uh, crime stories. Yeah? yeah, it's very rare the depiction of wor work, and I really like it too. And when I can, I I record it. I mean, we are pestered by these middle class families from. Uh, especially U.S. films. I mean, there's always this middle-class family guy who saves his shitty little family from from and saves the world. And so I, I'm really enraged when I see that. And I hope and the blockbusters don't talk about them. I mean, but I hope it's all er erased by the COVID now that we get a new kind of film culture and not get this stupid middle-class little family that has so many problems and then they come together again. I mean, it makes me sick. Sorry. <laughs> we, are, we know we are, what we are talking about. <laughs> I remember, for example, this serial here, um, also because of HBO. <laughs> I must look. What? <laughs> the HBO serial, uh, Chernobyl. Yeah? This was mm. very fantastic. You can see workers there. Yeah? There was this scene where these workers, they know that they will die because they have to work there uh, under the radio, radioactivity and they put out their clothes and they're working naked with, a, with proudness. Yeah? And uh, this is a fantastic scene. I have never seen this uh, since Giga Vertov, for example. Yeah? I think uh, I always wanted to ask you, uh, Christian, why didn't your guy at the end of Undine go into that lake? I would have, for me, it would have been so much nicer. I mean, <laughs> he gets back to his family. What a happy end, I mean. I think, yeah, this was a question the producer asked me too, because he was, he was there on the last day of shooting, where we, we have shot uh, chronological, yeah? he stands there mm -hmm. waiting champagne because this was the last day of shooting and I asked he has to he had to stay in the water yeah he had to stay in the water and i say no because undine said he had to leave the water yeah it's not it's his decision yes it's her decision mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> i'm going to try to squeeze in a few more a uh, few more audience questions in our remaining 10 minutes um an anonymous attendee um is asking Christian, what, what other historical events would you like to see represented on film? Other historical, uh, uh, I, I don't know. 
I'm, I'm surrounded by German television and they, they, for example, I'm really sure that German producers, they have a calendar, yeah, a list with uh, things from history which has now uh, uh, an anniversary. Yeah? And they create movies about that, sometimes serials about that. And they're waiting when, when they're 70, uh, uh, 75 years of, of the end of Auschwitz, they make a movie about that. Or twelve, uh, and so I, I'm on my way away from these historical themes. I must say, I, I prefer, I prefer the the the, the, the small family uh, in comparing to these historical things. I can't see them anymore. I can't see all these biopics and all the actors who are look have a look alike, like Winston Churchill or, or Willy Brandt or so. It's, I can't st stand that anymore. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> so the, Heinz, I mean, same question for you. I don't, are there any historical events you want to see represented on film? Yes. Uh, I want to, uh, not a historical event, I want to, do a picture about the thinking of Wilhelm II, which was uh, uh, of Hohenzollern. And the Hohenzollern clan is the most Nazi uh, uh, robber clan Germany has ever seen. And I want to go into their thinking and create something out of that. That might be a family film too, it's a <laughs> ghast family. They were they were lucky that they were not shot at the end of World War One, so they shouldn't make a big business about getting all their castles and pictures back now. It's ridiculous. So uh, even when I think about it now, I get really uh, enraged. So I have to come down and. Uh, so William the Second, tell that person William the Second is the. <laughs> Is the most disgusting person on earth, and he is. <laughs> I, I I agree totally. I must say, he, they give him the possibility after the first world war that he can go to an exile to the Netherlands with money, a, a train filled up with with gold and pictures and everything. And these these crazy uh, fascist Hohenzollern nowadays, they want to have all their things back there. Yeah, it's. I, I'm, I'm totally embarrassed about that, and, uh, <laughs> and and for me, the, the big tragedy is uh, the lost revolution, 1918, in the November. This is the uh, this is the hardest thing. What happened that after all these soldiers from the First World War, the Freikorps soldiers, all the fascists, they they destroyed uh, the the d democracy later. Yeah? And it's also built up on this Wilhelm and Hohenzollern and all these incest crazy guys. They are all, uh, I think that they're also genetic, uh, perverted. Yeah? And um, so this, this is, I think it's a, the big, it's a big date in uh, a tragic date in the German history. So. Um, <laughs> I think people are enjoying, uh, people enjoy the rant, Heinz. They love to say some, uh, one comment is, uh, name some names, Heinz. And another one is, we love you, Heinz. So I think they, I think they enjoy that. <laughs> uh, and a provocative question for you here. Um, in Streetscape's dialogue, you said, well, probably not you, the John Erdman figure said uh, that you didn't like most films from the new German cinema. Uh, interested yeah. to know your thoughts on the Berlin School. Oh, well, the Berlin School, that's a, that's a phrase. And I think like Christiana, Thomas and uh, Angela will not like that phrase. It's a journalistic phrase that was put on them and some other people too, maybe. And I think it's so ridiculous that I don't even want to go into it because I would like to see their, the work of individual filmmakers and I, and I want to discuss that and not some kind of school. They, well, they went to the, some kind of school, but uh, what is that? I mean, I, we all went to school. But um, no, but what I said there in Streetscapes is really true. I don't, I was pestered by, I went to the U US in 1974 
because I ran away from young German film, they call it, and then they came back after me through the Goethe house. And it was so terrible, you couldn't run around the world and they were always after you. There are hardly any good films, I must say. And I always like other films, like I liked uh, Dreyer, I liked uh, uh, Buñuel, of course, and I liked uh, uh, Joseph von Sternberg, Bresson, but hardly anybody of this so-called new German film. They were so uh, over the top with their uh, being new or something. And what did they actually do? Study it. It's not something really new there. Papa's Kino again. Well, Christian, now it's your turn. <laughs> Have a round. <laughs> For me, it was a problem with these movies in the 70s. I, I was too young, yeah. But um, later, when I saw the movies by Fassbinder, Wenders, Schlöndorf, the new drum cinema, it, uh, mostly it was based on theater. Also, the actors are always from theater. And this, um, this yeah. tradition I don't like so much. Yeah? For me, I was not at 74 in the USA, but it, it would be. It, it, uh, would be better for me to have stayed there yeah, to see what fantastic acting there is possible, yeah? what fantastic um, uh, seeing of the world is there. Yeah? But there are some of these movies of the 70s I like very much, yeah? but it's, uh, it's not this uh, branding of uh, this new German cinema of this time. Yeah? For me, it was very, I was, uh, when I was 14, I was, uh, I, I was a big fan of a German pop group. The Can was the name of the band. Uh, I have all records from by them. And there was a, a, a movie in the afternoon on the, on the Saturday or Sunday in television uh, with the music by The Can. And it's a movie by Ben Wenders. I haven't heard, I hadn't heard that, that name before. Uh, it's Alice in den Städten. It means Alice in the cities. In the cities, uh, yeah. in the cities. And, I, I, uh, I grew up between Düsseldorf and Wuppertal, and this movie uh, was shot 25 minutes or 30 minutes in Wuppertal, and it was shot in a in a gelateria, an ice uh, ice cream uh, salon saloon. Yeah? Uh, there's a sequence there: a young boy is buying himself an ice cream, and he had a has a nickel for a for a uh, for a vertice uh, jukebox. Yeah? And there was a song by Kenneth Heat going up the country and he's eating his ice cream and he's hearing the song three minutes without any cut. Yeah? And uh, uh, this was the uh, gelateria, or the, uh, uh, it, the name was uh, the, the, um, Taormina, Taormina, Salon Ta Taormina, where I was, uh, have bought my ice cream each day. I, saw, uh, I know this word, it's a jukebox. I know this place. And in this moment, this place was bewitched. Yeah, because of the scene and because of there is no cut because of a nine-year-old boy, yeah, it could be me, yeah, and about uh, uh, a voyage he started in this three minutes with this ice cream and this American song into something else. Yeah? And this, uh, this was a moment where I think uh, this was the best moment of the German cinema of the 70s for me. <laughs> but can heat and can is something very different, isn't it? Yeah, but the, the music from can was the soundtrack, and uh, can oh, heat was can the music. in the cities. Now I see. It. Well, the producer of can was such a great guy. He must have yeah. lived around your corner. Yeah, yeah he's fantastic. Yeah, uh -huh. he died. Mm -hmm. Well, we are just about out of time, but uh, I thought just to, you know, to conclude, is there anything else that either of you wanted to bring up or expand on or ask each other? Yeah, be, uh, I would say it's a great idea that you do this, that you bring people from so-called, that uh, you call it genre, yeah, genre agnostic, yeah, and that you bring people from so-called different genres, because I think there is no, not, so much a difference between uh, filmmakers and you get divided. I mean, this kind of discussion would have been almost impossible in Germany, you know, because they still think there is these several classes of filmmaking uh, 
Um, so one other thing I want to add to the new German film uh, uh, discussion, and that is that there were different centers in Germany. There was Hamburg with a very tough avant-garde uh, experimental cinema, and there was Munich with narrative music. And then there was Berlin with very heavy uh, political stuff. So it's very interesting how these three centers somehow mingled during time and so. But uh, I think, uh, thank you, Dennis, for having us and doing this. It should take place more often, I think, yeah. I agree, Christian, you have anything else? I, I agree to this, what Heinz says, uh, um, the, <laughs> the separation yeah, uh, between uh, the different kinds of movies, yeah, uh, which is now very, very hard yeah, very deep. Yeah? This, uh, I, I like it when, 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 when I'm Vienna, in the Viennale or in the New York Film Festival at Lincoln Center, that uh, these are places where, uh, where you can meet again. Yeah? That's, that's really great to hear. Um, this has certainly uh, lived up to expectations. Maybe we should do this every year, <laughs> the two of you together. Um, just a quick, uh, I know, Heinz, you mentioned your next project is the, the Slaughterhouse um, of Modernity. Uh, great title. Um, Christian, you mentioned when I did the Q&A with you that you have, you, you have this, the script already written um, for the next film and you will go into production next year hopefully yeah I wait when when this uh, covid pandemic uh, things are are gone then i will start working no? but you, right yeah. you mentioned that you're working with actors now like what are you working you, you said you're doing a workshop with actors right now is that a yeah with theater actors i want to to educate them for the cinema it's a very hard job <laughs> really hard job. <laughs> <laughs> what are you showing oh. them oh good luck <laughs> <laughs> And the first sequence I showed them in the seminar was from by Sam Fuller, uh, uh, pick up on South Street, the pickpocket scene at the at the at the tube. Yeah? They were totally. The, the, I, I like these students. One of the girls said, uh, she was twenty one. Now I can throw all the things away I have learned. <laughs> this I like very much. Her reaction. Yeah? Great. Well. Um... We look forward to uh, seeing your next works, uh, bringing you back to New York in person, and maybe we'll do this uh, in person together one day. I wanna thank you both so much for your time today, and thank you for being part of the festival. Um, and thanks to everybody for, for tuning in today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, take care. Bye. Bye.